Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to do a video now on the anarcho-primitivist philosophy of John Zerzan. In this video, I'll cover the whole book, The Twilight of the Machines. Now, Zerzan is a great example of somebody who not only gives us a serious critique of industrialism, in fact, for him, the only response, which is extreme enough, is to go all the way back to hunting and gathering, but he actually provides the explicit connections with, uh, say, continental philosophy, whereas for other thinkers like, say, Michael Rupert or um, even uh, Penty Linkola, in many cases, Ted Kaczynski, those connections you as the reader kind of have to make for yourself, whereas for Jean Zerzan, he actually shows you how exactly his own theory relates to uh, actually a very large Large number of different philosophers. In fact, he's been criticized for excessively referencing um, thinkers uh, in, in, in disagreement with postmodernist philosophy, etc. But I actually don't find that to be a weakness on his part. I think that we should be very um, thankful that there is uh, such a figure as him who's kind of joining those two fields of thought, which all too often you might have really good work in, in critique of industrialism without the philosophy part, or you might have really good work in philosophy without the criti serious critique of industrialism part. And Zerzan is almost unique in his uh, decision to join those two uh, in kind of a, you know, interdisciplinary fashion in the proper sense of the terms. So while Zerzan um, does reject the term post-left anarchy, largely because he sees that as just another form of postmodernism in disguise, he does explicitly identify himself with the anti-left anarchy movement, and in the preface to this work, he distances himself from the standard leftist stance, showing that if you cling to politics, that is to say, if you think that the solution would be to just select people from the right party, and that is what leftists think, by the way, is all you have to do is put in Democrats and get the Republicans out. That's not good enough for Zerzan because that's just another way to avoid confronting the devouring logic of civilization as such, to use his own terms. So he agrees with Kaczynski's idea, really, that leftist political activism is just another surrogate activity. It allows you to feel like you're doing something, but not only does it not change the um, technological system as such, it actually just reinforces it, would be Ted Kaczynski's argument. Zerzan agrees with that, but he also argues that leftist political activism misses the point of the situation on a properly epistemological level, and he argues that it does that in one sense by failing to de-reify the givens which are handed to us from the system. So reification, of course, uh, comes from the Latin term for thing, res. It's the idea that you're thingifying something to make it seem real, eternal, substantial, when in reality it's just a construct which is contingent upon something else. And if you focus on the thing which is reified, you miss that deeper context which allows it to operate. And for him, that deeper context is not capitalism in the Marxist as the Marxists would believe, it's not fossil fuels, as somebody like, I don't know, Michael Rupert or Richard Heinberg would argue. It's not even um, technology, as, as uh, Ted Kaczynski or uh, Jacques Ellul would argue. It's um, simply agriculture and the de-reification of the, the constructs of the, the political procedure which leftists um, cannot see beyond, um, the de-reification of all of that stuff could only come about if you realize that everything which seems real to us, um, basically without exception in the world we live in now, is dependent upon a certain ecological context dominated by agriculture. And therefore, the only response which will be good enough is to literally go back to being a hunter-gatherer. If you do that, you will have a change of mindset in which the basic shape through which you see reality will change, he argues, from the shape of domination, which defines agriculture, to the shape of egalitarianism. Leftists, because they're not willing to take it that far, they might, you know, talk about moving beyond capitalism, for example, in favor of going to communism, which is even more industrial. Um, by the way, um, but since they're not willing to go all the way to abandoning agriculture, they're really thinkers of domination in disguise, whether they realize it or not. And you can only move beyond the basic shape of domination to the shape of egalitarianism if you make what I would call a somatic shift to hunting and gathering. If you do so, you'll realize the uselessness of politics in the usual sense, because all 
everything we consider to be the political process of engagement is a euphemism for living in a world of agriculture in disguise. If you make the shift to hunting and gathering, you'll realize that the basic political structure of that worldview is actually just anarchy. So if you realize that the objective factor is agriculture rather than, say, fossil fuels or capitalism, you'll realize a few things. There is no alternative energy paradigm, which is actually compatible with the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Any appeal to post-left this or that is just another meaningless parasite on the postmodernist and post-structuralist nonsense, which is itself agricultural thinking in disguise. Any hope to preserve technology but engineer all of the ecological damage out of it, which is an inherently contradictory goal, has to be abandoned. But of course, all of this is just another way of saying that um, the sheep and goats will be separated by those who realize, as he says himself, that the brave new world now moving forward was born with the shift to domestic domesticated life, not with the um, Industrial Revolution as such. Therefore, in the first chapter, two marvelous four words, he argues that if civilization is, in essence, the replacement of natural spontaneity with artificial rationality, a point which Jacques Ellul has also made, then the chief weapon used to accomplish this is none other than symbolic thought itself. It was no coincidence that language as we now know it only really began with the fall towards domestication and domination. The true hunter-gatherers of the distant past did not actually use a language, but they still communicated in a superior way without alienation. Was that perhaps by mind reading? or some other sort of uh, telepathic abilities. Certainly, you could argue that, as Kaczynski himself did from his reading of Zerzon. But it's definitely the case that for Zerzon, symbolic thought is, in general, only about 35,000 years old and represents only one way of seeing and connecting which humans could use. Although it is forbidden by postmodern theory, John Zerzon commits the Orwellian thought crime of arguing that there is a distinction between direct vision and the logic of substitution, which someone like Jacques Derrida claims is uh, just an irreducible structure you can never get beyond. Language is defined by substitution because even the rules of grammar, which have to be used, um, in order to traffic in well-formed strings to be understood by other people are rules which were never chosen by the subject, and because the subject is put into a position of depending on these rules, even to be able to think, that is in itself a form of domination reminiscent of the deep meme of agriculture itself. In other words, even to be able to begin to think you have to already be using domination and to be dominated yourself. Um, he argues that this way of thinking also favors abstract structure over immediate perception because language substitutes um, syntactical constructs, none of which were directly derived from any one person's experience. The root of our ongoing spiritual crisis is precisely this movement away from immediacy to instead a symbolic order which necessarily erodes and destabilizes any claim to substance within our experience of the world itself. Our experience of the world kind of dissolves into a set of ever more abstract constructs, all of which somehow go back to agriculture in disguise. Language is actually negative in essence, if you think about it, because it's nothing more than the negation of presence. And most important of these, of course, is the face-to-face -face experience, which had defined the true communities of the hunter-gatherer golden age. Therefore, the greatest irony about technology is even though technology is explicitly focused on solving the challenge of making us all connected. I remember Mark Zuckerberg had a really stupid interview where he argued that the kinds of problems facing the world today are so big that no one person can solve them on their own. For example, you can only have a cure for cancer if you have the whole world connected. Therefore, you need Facebook to cure cancer, is his own argument. And the funny thing about it, as uh, John Zerzon has noted himself, is that precisely when we solve the challenge of making the whole world connected on technological 
grounds, we all became more disconnected as a result. And this is not a coincidence because it, whether you consider language, number, or art, all three of these are just variations on the same essence of substitution, which is itself just the general structure of domination in agriculture. Technology, however, makes a big problem even worse by introducing digitization, which inherently negates the um, senses by, ironically enough, overflowing them with stimulation and content, as I am writing in my upcoming book, Hermeneutical Death. Therefore, in the second chapter, Patriarchy, Civilization, and the Origins of Gender, he argues that any claim to feminism, which does not question agriculture, cannot be taken seriously. The only way to end domination of women, he argues, is to end domination, and for that you have to end agriculture. And in fact, the gender element was an essential factor in the somatic shift to farming from the beginning. This is because um, the automatic shape or deep meme of hunting gathering is egalitarianism precisely on grounds of gender. That is to say, you can only have gender equality if you have this more fundamental type of equality. In fact, whereas we usually picture hunter-gatherers as bands of men with spears tracking woolly mammoths, we forget that about 80% of the diet is actually gathering and only about 20% hunting. Women's role in gathering is all too often forgotten, but it was uh, massively important. But then again, even the concept of gender as we now know it cannot be understood without the shift to agriculture, because this is just one more given which must be de-reified. And for in chapter 3, he talks about the origins of war, showing that war is not an accidental feature, which, you know, we can just evolve to a, uh, a pacifist, but still... Um, industrial or agricultural society, it's rather a staple of civilization. Proof of this lies in the fact that the very concept of war is indigenous only to the somatic um, context of agriculture, and he claims uh, does not exist in the form we know it within hunting and gathering. It's no coincidence that the world got more civilization over time, but it always got more war directly in proportion as a result. Of course, uh, John Zerzon had to refute the myth that anarchy is the Hobbesian war of all against all, as most people would argue. Um, this is cited, in fact, as a justification for why the necessary evil of a state monopoly and violence has to be accepted into the indefinite future, simply because the alternative is a state where everyone basically fights each other for no reason, is what people think anarchy would be. Zerzon says that itself is just one more reification, which stinks of agricultural thinking. And if you really consider on a memological level, organized violence um, only has one automatic shape through which it could make sense, and that is domination. Within the um, deep meme of egalitarianism, you literally can't imagine it because the coordinates are not there. Cezanne says that this memological shift did not occur in a vacuum, and rather followed after a drastic change in society's physical situation. The physical situation is kind of Zerzon's own term for what I would call somatic or ecological context. In other words, it wasn't enough for the idea of domination to be there. You actually had to have some sort of physical basis, and that, of course, was agriculture. Don't believe him? Just think of the epistemological requirements of war. You can only have it if the enemy becomes faceless. You can only have an anonymous enemy if you have symbolic thought, if you have language, mathematics, etc., in other words. This is because you have to lose the presence of the other and instead assume that the substitution of symbols is the default mode of experience in order to actually fight people you basically don't even know. In addition, the introduction of rigid rituals which are acted out without choice and without even understanding why one is doing so later evolves into the grotesque ritual of organized violence itself. In contrast, foraging is not ritual. It is a spontaneous act carried out with freedom and with presence. In Kaczynski's terms, that's not surrogate activity. That's actually going through the power process with freedom. Therefore, he argues, all social inequality is actually ritual in disguise, kind of sounding almost like David Icke here, um, in which people are trained to assume a social role, whether it makes sense to them intellectually or not. 
Rituals also have a social organization with some people assuming the role of priest and others assuming the role of congregant. Ritual is therefore agrarian domination, plain and simple in disguise. One should be reminded that the ethos of domestication was malicious from the start because the horse was domesticated for war and not for any good purpose, contrary to what you might think. In contrast with the attitude of dominating in order to accomplish my goals, kind of similar to uh, the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory way of phrasing it, the hunter-gatherer mindset is one of feelings of gratitude and free giving, he says. Notice that the two are reciprocal in this case, rather than isolated into a single mind which is merely trying to accomplish its own projects. This is um, something which uh, Raymond Wharton has also mentioned, um, the, uh, the abilities of um, some animals which can only be unlocked in community, but in the kind of natural community which say a small band of hunter-gatherers um, presuppose rather than the artificial globalized pseudo-community which we have now which ironically enough does not allow many of those to be uh, many of our potentials to be unlocked. And for it's precisely because real reciprocity is lost on a memological level in the shift to agriculture that group cohesion falls apart and has to be supplemented by a symbolic institution which artificially fills in the gaps in community by coercing people to assume their roles and carry out their orders by force. Interestingly, because he despises it so much, he argues that the deep meme of agriculture is not the circle, as I have claimed, rather the deep meme of agriculture is just the shape of rows of corn. It is no coincidence that soldiers are only interpreted as identical and therefore all equally able to die if they are standardized into rows which resemble the rows of grain that you would find in a field. Any concept of work therefore is unique to this deep meme. Hunting and gathering is not work as we know the term because there is no coercion involved there. Yet war has a special place because it's both the cause and the effect of domination. Therefore, in chapter 4, The Iron Grip of Civilization, he um, uses the term reorientation of the human mentality to refer to something like what I would call the memological shift. He argues that the Iron Age was, in fact, the completion of the fall into domination, which had begun much, uh, much earlier. In other words, the completion of the fall wasn't uh, the Industrial Revolution or the invention of the smartphone. It was um, quite a long time ago. Um, and this trend in the Iron Age, um, was, uh, which was completed, was simply a negative trend in which you progressively lost the wholeness um, and meaningful human scales which had defined the hunter-gatherer golden age and therefore lost structures which could be grasped intuitively. Instead, you now had a recalibration of consciousness which was structured by symbol and substitution by necessity. In the Iron Age, therefore, language shifts from a naming process to a fixation on static properties of fixed objects. Inevitably, as a result of that, you have sprawling systems begin to appear. Likewise, the single deity emerges as a result by offering a direct connection to the ultimate spiritual reality, but this was itself only necessary because of the total breakdown of real human community, which continues to the present day. Like Elul, therefore, he argues that daily life is submitted to rationalization and control, two words really for the same thing, if you think about it. And therefore, once again, you're only really serious about critiquing um, political injustice if you're willing to go as far as realizing that plows and writing are also domination because they too are forms of technological rationalization, even if they seem to be pre-technological to the modern naive thinker. Therefore, Zerzan argues that progress is not a distinct deep meme, as I myself have argued. Rather, the ideology that newer is better dates back to Xenophanes and the Iron Age, long before petroleum, coal, and natural gas were used on industrial levels. For Zerzan, fossil fuels cannot be the objective factor because they're just a smaller part of this logic of domination, which is itself agriculture.
Likewise, what we seek to reclaim is precisely the wholeness which we have lost, but Zerzan warns it's not the counterfeit wholeness of, as I would say, the agrarian circle. It's rather the real wholeness of the hunter-gatherer shape of egalitarianism, or what I would call the level plane of reciprocity. Therefore, in chapter 5, Alone Together, the City and its Inmates, he notes that the city might look like a container which unites all of its inmates, but in reality, the city is a barrier. It makes everyone within it into strangers who are alone together. Real unity can only be found in the hunter-gatherer worldview. Even place itself vanishes within the city as each building shares the same negative placelessness as all the others. Liberal fantasies about transforming cities into green campuses miss the point that cities only appear after tools become systems of technology as such. Did you notice, by the way, that the super ancient descriptions of cities are negative? For example, talk of Cain's destination, Old Testament portrayals of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, Sodom and Gomorrah, etc. By the way, medieval accounts of Rome portrayed as a filthy, dangerous, and crumbling hellhole. As you know, cities are in pre-modern times especially, just places for plagues and other diseases to spread. Another problem with cities is that it is hard to imagine our notion of time without them. Although time might be taken for granted as so real that it's never not existed, you only get time as an explicit schema of organization of human labor, by the way, when you get clocks in the 1500s, which were, of course, within cities. Now, lived experience is actually contrasted with the objectified time of measure. This is because the city required its inmates to adopt a spirit of passivity, which is synonymous with our passivity towards technology in general. Suburbs, for example, are not exceptions. They're not, not cities, whereas mandatory urbanization um, was colonialism, Mod uh, mandatory suburbanization, he says, is just leftism. Therefore, in uh, chapter 7, Beyond Symbolic Thought, he argues that the grand irony about natural anarchy is that it is the only sustainable option on ecological grounds alone. If you give technology a future, the only future it could have is the destruction of the planet itself. But of course, the insistence that it could never be done is just a tactic for the elite class to maintain its status through forcing people to assume their roles in the artificial society of agricultural domination. Luckily, there is already a conscious turn against civilization that has begun. The question is just whether this is a mimological shift as such, or just the desire to have one. Therefore, in part two, Crisis of Civilization, he argues that there is a strange sense in which the ecological crises have made us so depressed that we take antidepressants even to the point of polluting the environment through our urine alone. How can this madness not be recognized by people, however, except that there's a memological shift which would be required to see it for what it really is? You can only de-reify these givens if you actually change the underlying shape. Therefore, the biggest error to avoid is to think that leftists could ever rebel against this scenario in particular. He says leftism is technology and cannot be compared to natural anarchy, which was the norm until 9,000 years ago. Not only have leftists failed nature, but the very ideology of postmodernism, which is kind of the de facto ideology of the left uh, today, is a pseudo-rebellion against the system because it's just another philosophy of despair which is directly generated by the suffering of technology itself. Worse yet, in celebrating difference and flux and forbidding presence, it simply reduplicates the essence of commodification and the movement of commodities across the globe, rather than take us back to the hunter-gatherer ways of doing things and of experiencing the world. Worst of all, even though postmodernism forbids any view of universals, that is to say, uh, there are no meta-narratives is the defining um, meta-narrative, ironically enough, of uh, postmodernism, it somehow accepts the universalization of technology as the one unspeakable exception. You can't have any center unless it's technology. For them, technology is so reified that it seems to have always been. 
even though its modern forms are all quite new and constantly uh, being updated in themselves. He expects, uh, he accepts, I should say, uh, Spengler's claim that collapse is inherent in all civilization because for him, anarchy is not a new innovation. It's a return to the actual norm which defined human existence in a kind of loosely defined sense of the term for millions of years. Therefore, in chapter 9, Exile from Presence, he argues that technologization inherently negates presence because floating data controlled by remote reign of surveillance is historically anomalous and inherently dominating on a memological level as well. Although this disembodiment really, he says, begins uh, to accelerate with Descartes, by today it has taken on truly absurd forms through technology in the modern sense. John Zerzon therefore explicitly praises Husserlian phenomenology and opposes Derrida by favoring presence, favoring embodiment over the normalization of estrangement, which Derrida's obsession with différence, etc., really is um, just another version of. Therefore, while Hegel and Derrida, he claims, both deny immediacy, um, Derrida, in particular, misses the point that although it is empirically correct today to say that presence is impossible, that is only because of a certain somatic shift away from hunting and gathering, which is itself historically contingent in nature. Presence is what Zerzan calls the primary quality of meaning on which all other modes of meaning of, are, are founded. In fact, the linguistic turn misses that point that whereas symbol or equivalence is founded on the deep meme of domination, in the hunter-gatherer meme, you have the concept of gift and the concept of non-return instead. In addition, the, the postmodern ban on talk of origins misses the point that going back to the origin of hunting gather, and gathering is precisely the solution. In chapter 10, the modern anti-world, he shows that whatever they might say, there really is only one civilization today, and that is the global domestication machine, which has sucked up virtually everything in its path. None of its claims, though, are valid because all of them are euphemisms for domination. The totality, therefore, is something which we do have to understand precisely as impoverished. Hasn't the whole world became, uh, become just the same routinized, meaningless control grid? localized places are, if they do exist, extremely rare, as the rest has turned into a universalized airport, which might as well be any place in the world. What we inhabit is more and more just symbols themselves, and therefore he explicitly praises Husserl once again for taking us back to phenomenological presence, rather than surrender to the linguistic turn myth that the only thing which you could ever do is traffic in symbolic substitutions. The present presence is not time, by the way, because time is historical progress in which technology organizes its conquest of the world on a structural level, while presence in reality is just awareness. Do we have no choice but to accept the sad state of affairs, or is reification as such just a form of passivity in disguise. Fatalism, by the way, is technology, whereas freedom as such can only be found in hunting and gathering. For example, even the fear of leaving civilization behind is not natural. That is a mythological construct based on Hobbes's idea of the war of all against all and Hollywood portrayals, which uh, convince you to think that the same cardboard big mansion in suburbia, which you don't even enjoy living in, is the only safe space in the world. Therefore, in chapter 12, Overman and Unabomber, he shows a number of interesting parallels between Nietzsche and Ted Kaczynski. For example, Nietzsche had this concept of will to power and Kaczynski had the concept of the power process. Nietzsche dismissed Christianity as slave morality, while Kaczynski argued that leftists project their own feelings of resentment in acts of hostility, which masquerade as selfless champion of political causes for oppressed groups. There are some differences, though. Um, Nietzsche valued hierarchy over the herd and over the rabble, by positing the um, overman above them, as Kaczynski, at least before the arrest, um, favored anarchy. 
and favored face-to-face -face community. There was one unpublished letter in which he praised the traditional hunter-gatherer communities um, of less than 100 people, for example, as being the natural um, uh, mode of human organization, which is to be contrasted, of course, with the globalized pseudo-society which we live in today. And for in chapter 13, Zerzan um, favors um, a response to the question of why primitivism by asking whether the current drug epidemic might just be a means to an end to mask the massive alienation caused by technological civilization itself. Yet postmodernism in its attempts to deal with the problems of the world is inherently self-contradictory because it forbids any talk of absolutes and eternal givens with only one very notable exception, the alienation which is itself just technology in disguise is precisely what they posit as absolute and eternally given. Think alienation is the norm, as you probably would from listening to the uh, post-structuralist nonsense at your local college campus. He says there are two million years of the deep meme of hunting and gathering, and just 10,000 years of the failed experiment in agricultural domination, and far less time than that in its most modern forms. So thank you for watching the video. I enjoy uh, discussion and hope to speak more on these topics.